Right. Um, as people start coming in, let me kick off this uh, panel on protecting EU 2019 elections, a joint responsibility. My name is Chiara. I work um, at Google here in the Brussels team. Thank you for braving the snow um, and the dire weather. I have to apologize. Uh, a couple of our panelists couldn't make it uh, today because nature prevented them uh, from being here. Our colleagues, Scott. Uh, Carpenter is actually uh, stuck on a plane that left London, almost arrived in Brussels and had to go back uh, to London, which I am interpreting as some kind of Brexit metaphor that I'm not going to get into here. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for our panelists who did make it. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. This panel is on elections. Um, I cannot stress enough how important uh, an issue this is for Google. We've been um, increasing our efforts on this uh, over the past few years. Milan will tell you more about what we're doing on the 2019 elections um, here in Brussels specifically uh, and across Europe. I do want to make a point for all people in the audience who are uh, European citizens living in Brussels. You have to register to vote for the European elections and the deadline is the 28th of February. So don't forget, protecting elections also means uh, people should vote in them and participate. So I just want to make that point. I leave the word now to Lucas Ilves. Um, you probably know him. He's um, deputy director of the Lisbon Council and you must have uh, inter interacted with him before in his lives at the council and the commission. So Lucas, please take it away. Thank you for that introduction. So um, today's panel, I mean, I really like the panel because it's not about abstract concepts like cybersecurity or data protection. It's about a real world phenomenon where all of these things come together. And when you talk about cybersecurity um, and, and security, you always have that question of, well, are we talking about fake news, a sort of Chinese and Russian sense of information warfare? Are we talking about technical cybersecurity? Are we talking about governments or individuals? And frankly, we have all of that on our plate. And uh, this panel is a bit like elections and uh, cyber attacks against elections. They're unpredictable, they uh, cause last minute changes and they force us to be adaptive. Um, so one thing I wanna say right from the get go um, is this is going to be an interactive discussion. Uh, we are going to start with the panelists talking but the best knowledge that we have on what's going on in 28 countries is actually among the people from those countries. So I, do in, I, I know that all of you know a lot about what's going on on this topic and I really warmly encourage you once we get to the discussion, grab the mic, challenge us, put some evidence on the table, because at the end of the day, we can disagree on a lot of policy issues, but what I do think we agree on is that there are some bad outcomes um, on the European elections that we all would like to avoid. Um, and that's what this is about. So enough from me. Um, we have three fantastic discussants here. Yves Ulrich, who is from the uh, cabinet of European uh, first vice, no, not first, for, is he vice president? No, just Commissioner King, uh, but previously from the European Political Strategy Center, so he's put a lot of thinking into this topic. Uh, then we're going to hear from Milan, who will talk about what the private sector is doing, um, Google in particular, but maybe also in general about how we can work together on this. And finally, we're going to hear from Despina, who I understand has been titled by Commissioner King, Mrs. Cybersecurity, um, and will tell us about how the pedal actually hits the metal, how preparations are going. I will try and grill them a bit, but I ask you to do the same. So with that, Ulrich, the floor is yours. There we go. Yeah. Well, thank you, for, first of all, very much for, for coming today and for, uh, and for inviting us to come here and, uh, and share a few thoughts. Uh, like Lucas said, I'm uh, now with, I'm a member of cabinet with Commissioner King, and that happened pretty recently, so one and a half weeks ago. That's why uh, things might not have have uh, have have the have all changed uh, in in programs and and whatnot. Uh, so I'm going to give a bit of an overview, just of uh, maybe setting the scene for for why are we doing this, uh, and and then I will leave to the spina a little more uh, on the preparedness of the member states, and we can get into that maybe more in the discussion as well. I think first of all, it's important to remember that what we're going towards in May is actually one of the world's largest democratic exercises. 300 million voters will vote across 27 nations. That's quite a lot. Um, and when we look at what, for instance, Freedom House has been saying, they say that this information is now something that is in interfering into elections uh, and co countries in general in, in more than 30 places. 
we have more than 18 elections that we know have been somehow interfered with uh, by either foreign actors or to some extent domestic actors as well, where we don't know how exactly uh, the, uh, the, the, the division is between those two. We also know that the Scripple case is one of the most state-of-the-art cases of how these things work. Again, more than 30 different or even deceptive or contradicting narratives were put out by different uh, Russian either official or non-official um, representatives from media institutions as well. Uh, so it's important to know that this, is, this has been a long time coming. Someone has been developing this concept that we're seeing now uh, being applied to EU elections and to European elections in general for a long time. And maybe Russia has been uh, the big perpetrator of this to some extent or Kremlin linked, uh, linked entities. But it's certainly something that other people are learning from today as well. And that's why we need to get into this space. We also need to remember that this comes at a time when democracies are under pressure in general. This year is the 12th year consecutively where democracy has been on the decline when we measure it against international democratic uh, indexes. That's actually something to keep in mind, that this is not just disinformation, it's not just a small blip in the, in the, in the, on the screen, it's, it's actually a broader thing that's happening. And EU citizens can feel it too, and they can see it too. We asked EU citizens back in September through one of our Eurobarometer exercises and by November we could see that 7 out of 10 EU citizens now fear that disinformation will somehow interfere with their elections. Also 6 out of 10 EU citizens fear that cyber attacks will somehow manipulate with election results. So this means we have to deliver as the Commission, as the EU, as member states, uh, to protect. But we also need to restore trust, basically, in the integrity of what we call the democratic model of governance. So what are the threats? Um, as we see it, they can be split in two. You have the one which is attacks targeting systems and data and you have the other, which is manipulation of voting and behavior. The first is rather crude. It's targeting, for instance, voting machines. We've seen now that some of the voting machines which have been used for, say, 11 years in the United States, in Florida, one of the key states in US elections, has had a password of A, B, C, D, E for 11 years. And actually, we saw with uh, DEF CON revelations at the conference in the US that some of these machines can be hacked in two minutes over Wi-Fi. So it means that there's certainly a security issue that we haven't been aware of. At the same time, we've seen that there's been people and especially hackers probing into uh, certain uh, voter, voter data and, and registries. Even in Germany, we saw a 29-year-old IT master student uh, show that he could access the data of 70,000 polling stations in Germany. So that's the first uh, threat. The second one is a little more complex. And that goes for, that can be split into three things. The first one we know very well, it's hack and leaks, Macron leaks, DNC leaks, etc., to try and influence the voting behavior or, or at least the, the perception of what our governments are doing, uh, etc. The second is disinformation or even fake news sometimes. Those are not necessarily the same thing. Where we see that critical news pieces can sometimes reflect a very, very biased approach, so we call it propaganda, uh, while other things are actually just fake. And we've seen it uh, time and time again here in Europe. It's not something we see every day, but it does happen. And it can turn around uh, elections. And third, we see what I will call psychometrically targeting of people based on illegally acquired data. And to some extent also 
data which is acquired in the gray zone area, which we have now become aware of, uh, should be somehow legislated, such as Cambridge Analytica. So, for all of this, the member states are the first and last defense in any election. But the EU has had to step into this vacuum um, in some, with some of these th threats um, because there was an, a, a call from member states and there was certainly also a need to protect EU citizens more and better and doing it by co coordinating more. In 2015, just remembering the, the EU has actually been working on this for three and a half years, East Stratcom was established. In 2017, after collecting a lot of data and understanding the threat much more, because we didn't before, we, now, we then launched uh, an initiative to, that could lead, to, lead towards what would be the April communication that came out in 2018. And with this communication, we then defined what we thought was disinformation. We had to move away from the whole debate of fake news. We had to move into a more a more selective uh, approach to it to make sure that we didn't interfere too much with um, with free speech and uh, and other important liberties that we have in our democracies and that we cherish. I can I can go on with all the initiatives, but just to mention again, uh, we had the April communication. Then we had a compendium to protect uh, election technologies came out uh, from member states in over the summer last year. We had the September communication on free and fair elections, basically stretching the GDPR into the election space, also for parties. We had a high-level conference on uh, how to gather cyber uh, experts and election authority experts in mem from member states, which had not been talking to each other before, to make sure that they moved into this space together. We had the code of practice, where the platforms committed, uh, together with other signatories, to actually do something about these problems on their uh, platforms, on top of what they had already done, of course. Uh, and then finally, this year, actually just yesterday, we had uh, the Commission's assessment of of uh, the progress that has been made uh, by the platforms and other signatories to the code of practice. Um, and basically, and this is where I'm gonna end, I would say we welcome the work of all the signatories. And it's clear that big leaps have been taken, especially on cutting down on fake accounts, on creating more transparency uh, for political ads. But we need to go much further and much faster. For instance, we lost about three or four months last year when we knew that we were aiming to actually have the code of practice done by summer. But instead, we could only get stakeholders around the table and actually agree on what we wanted to do before uh, in, in September, October. We lost crucial time there. And second, I would just say that we cannot wake up the day after the election and say we should have done more and that we could have done more. So I think right now from, from my commissioner and from the commission in general, the one thing we would really like to see from platforms is to create more transparency with our researchers and our civil society before the elections and in good time before the elections because that is what we can then use to actually have a debate about the integrity of the elections. If we don't do it after, we will not be able to have that. And we will only uh, see more decline of trust. And uh, we don't want to be in, the, in that situation. Thank you. Thank you. So, Milan, um, like many other parts of our lives, elections may be organized by governments, but a lot of the real interesting stuff, it's our societies as a whole. Uh, they're generally not using government-provided email and government-provided internet service. So tell us a bit about what Google's doing. Well, thank you, Elvis. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining the panel today. I think when we're talking about uh, elections, it's always good to come back to the, to the Google's mission, if I may, which is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible for everyone. Um, I think this really applies specifically for uh, the period of elections. Because what it means is to make sure that people, users of our services, have the most authoritative sources and the authoritative data. And also that the online flows are protected, secure and safe. Uh, 
Ulrich was uh, made a made a very nice leeway when he was uh, when he was talking about the disinformation. This applies to the first part of the mission, which is to provide the authoritative sources, to provide transparency, and to explain our users how our services work, to make sure that the services are not misused, are not gamed by bad actors, and we've been taking this. Uh, this mission, this goal, very seriously, and uh, and I think one of the one of the one of the milestones, very important ones for us, and it's really something I think very specific and very important, is the signature of the of the code of practice that we signed uh, in September October last year, and indeed uh, the first uh, report about about how we are uh, coming up to these commitments that was published uh, just yesterday by the European Commission together with other signatories and I welcome you, invite you all to read the reports, they are available on the Commission's website or so now blog post where we are very specifically describing what actions we have taken, what, what policies do apply for uh, political ads, uh, how we are ensuring the transparency but also how we are working with the, with the fact checkers, with the research community and indeed this is not the final step and we will be speeding up, we will be enrolling new transparency register for, uh, for all, the, all the users to see what kinds of ads they are being served based on which criteria. Uh, we will also make sure that, uh, the, 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 that the political advertisement is clearly labeled and is only ordered by European Union entities there is more to come. A lot of these things are already mentioned in the in the report. Uh, but let me let me move to the to the second part of this of this uh, bucket, which is which is the which is the security and which is also a topic of, of this uh, specific panel. When we are talking about protecting elections, it really means making sure that the voters, that the political campaigners. And that the political and that the public institutions are protected against online attacks, and uh, of course we've been all witnessing and seeing that the online attacks are peaking around uh, important parts such as uh, such as the elections, and we've seen phishing attacks uh, being targeted at uh, political political campaigners and being misused and really having an influence over the over the results of the elections. We've seen attacks on, uh, on websites, be it of the political parties or of, of public institutions, taking these websites down. And we've, we are thinking very hard and we are trying to help and trying to use our infrastructure, trying to use our services by A, building the safest services and tools possible, but also, also going even steps beyond and focusing on the, and giving extra layers of security to the most vulnerable groups. Uh, this is, a, this is a joint effort of all the different teams within, within the company, not with, just within Google, but, but generally within Alphabet. Trust and safety, there are, there are uh, threat uh, analysis groups, and there are really many specific groups making sure that this works. One of these groups is, uh, is, our, uh, is our specialized security team called Jigsaw. It's a, part with, it's a team within Alphabet. As you might have seen in the program, Scott Carpenter, who is hopefully not anymore circling somewhere above Heathrow, uh, would be sitting here on the panel and talking more specifically about uh, Jigsaw. So let me just uh, say a few first, a few words about Jigsaw. Jigsaw is a sort of laboratory within within Alphabet. It started as a Google Ideas a couple of years ago, and over time, uh, Jared Cohen, who was the founder of, of Jigsaw, together with Eric Schmidt and the, and the, and the, and the leadership of, of Google, realized that it's not just about about thinking, but it's also about involving engineers and really building tools for the most vulnerable groups. They are developing uh, specific projects on, uh, on uh, online hate speech, on, uh, on uh, disinformation, and also on security. And one of the, one of the uh, tools that is specifically important for, for this debate is called uh, Project Shield. I've mentioned uh, the ways of, of uh, taking down the websites. The most, uh, the most uh, efficient one is the, is the distributed denial of service attack, DDoS attack. I think we've, uh, most of, most of uh, us have heard about uh, examples of this being very efficiently employed. The thing is that it's very efficient and it's very cheap to employ. The Project Shield has originally been developed for the most vulnerable group, groups such as uh, NGOs and investigative journalists. 
those whose websites have been uh, very, uh, very often targeted with these attacks. But around the elections, we've seen peaks of, of using these tools to attack also uh, public institutions that are somehow related to the elections. I'm coming from the Czech Republic, and actually in the previous parliamentary elections, there was a successful DDoS attack uh, employed on the Czech Statistical Office. And also political parties and political candidates are being, are being targeted with those, with those attacks. So Project Shield, very, very simply put, is a, is a tool that, can, that, uh, that efficiently uh, protects websites from these attacks. It's uh, free of service. And uh, as of actually yesterday, we announced that, uh, that uh, the Shield is actually available for all political organizations across the European Union. So now we are working together with, uh, with public institutions in all member states, with political parties, just trying to spread the word and really make sure that uh, as many political organizations enroll on this, uh, on this tool uh, as possible. For this, we are also providing trainings for political organizations here in Brussels, also locally in all the capitals, really to spread the word, make sure that people know how to protect themselves from the DDoS attacks, but also from phishing attacks how to use two-step verification. Very, very simple things, but you would be surprised how many, how many uh, very high-level uh, people are still not using these, and of course then are much more vulnerable towards, towards such attacks. So, uh, I will probably stop here. Uh, we can then talk a little bit more about, about the specific trainings. I just wanted to give you a, a small, small overview of what we are doing. There is much more uh, in, terms of, in terms of security. And uh, just, I just wanted to repeat, uh, based, on, based, on, uh, based on what has been already said here, that we take the part of uh, responsibility very uh, heavily. We understand it and we want to work together with, with political campaigners, with public institutions, be it in the member states or here uh, in the European Union in Brussels, and really uh, tackle this challenge together. Thank you. So, Despina, um, when you say Two words, security and elections. These are two words where most people who've dealt with EU negotiations think, no, no, no. National governments will say no, that's for them. That's not something that should be done on a European level. Now, in spite of that, you have led a heroic effort to get the member states to actually work together on this topic and go against their usual red line. So I'm curious, what have you done so far? How have you gotten member states to actually work together on this? And where do we need to do more? Thank you. Um, I wouldn't call them necessarily heroic, the efforts, but thank you for the compliment. And in fact, no heroism was needed because we have seen a very important shift in the culture of member states when it comes to cybersecurity, in them wishing to work together. The compendium that everybody mentions and that has been now part even of a European recommendation, and Ulrich mentioned it earlier, was a product of um, a cooperation group of member states that was created by what everybody in the Brussels bubble knows, the NIS Directive. Now, why is this special? I've been dealing with European legislation for the last 20 years of my life. And the one thing you know as a lawyer when it comes to a directive is that it takes a lot of work to convince member states to transpose it, implement it. And when it came to this directive, that was hard to negotiate. It was hard to convince member states that there would be European cybersecurity law. But once it was agreed, the commitment of member states in engaging was incredible. The transposition deadline was the 9th of May, 2018. So it was not just the GDPR that had to be done by that time, but also the NIS. Still, this cooperation group came together already when the directive entered into force at the end of 2016. They started meeting and they started making a list of what are the biggest challenges we have to face and what can each of us bring in terms of experience. And we owe it to two member states representatives in this group who identified from their own experience in challenges they faced, one of them was from the Czech Republic and the other one was from Estonia. They identified challenges they had to deal with and they said, let us tell you what we know. They worked together on this compendium and it became a European point of reference. So there is a, a shift in, in the European thinking between member states that we need to apply the internal market thinking, which is exchanging best practices, working together, networking, also to cybersecurity. 
And when you work in the area of cybersecurity, you realize one thing, that there's also a very big shift in seeing cybersecurity as something that has to be dealt with in all areas of life, because everything is interconnected. And before it used to be seen like this separate technological issue, but it is not. If you're dealing with digital society, it is relevant at all levels. So elections is, is particularly important. Now, we have been working together under this NIS cooperation group and, and through our work with the member states to create as much of an information system as possible. The problem is that the problem will come where we don't know from. Uh, it's a, we, we are not prepared for what will come, that is for sure. So what we have to do is to be prepared by shielding, I like the word uh, shield that is used by everyone when it comes to security, by shielding our system. So we've been working at three levels. So preparedness of member states, uh, resilience, but then also defense, because you have to know what to do. In Europe for the last years, thanks to the European Cybersecurity Agency and ESA, we had the system of a, of a European exercise called Cyber Europe which brought together uh, the member states authorities to test uh, their capacities. But that's not enough because the authorities that were coming together was tho those that are dealing with this kind of issues, the experts. So now what we are doing is to bring together everybody else. So the election authorities have to be trained and to know how to identify a problem and who to call to deal with it and how to stop it. This is the most challenging thing and uh, the, mo the, the most important challenge. So uh, this is what we have done through this elections network. I will tell you that I was also impressed with the willingness of the member states when we carried out this two days conference that Commissioner King held. People came at very high level from all the authorities. They stayed for two full days. We sat in a room for half a day with the election authorities and with the security authorities of the cybersecurity teams of the member states, some of which had not spoken to each other until then, at national level, not cross-border, and who told us, can you please help us? And at least we put people together, that's the number one. We had the compendium as a piece of advice. And now we are agreeing on, uh, on an exercise that will test uh, the resilience of the system that will take place in the coming weeks. We had the first meeting of this election network on the 21st of January, and now we are agreeing on the process, and ENISA, the cybersecurity agency, will help us in this respect. Because everybody has to test their capacities and to see where their vulnerabilities and their needs are. And there's some embassies who are there desperate in identifying these capacities and these needs. So overall, I think there is a willingness to use Europe to learn more, because we also have the problem of the inherent problem of security and cybersecurity, that we have very few specialists, very few people who know what to do. So unless we exchange, we will not learn. And as much as it is important to have private-oriented uh, uh, and, um, and such initiatives like the one you described, Milan, coming from the private sector, the public sector has to take also its responsibility. They need to prepare themselves, they need to test themselves. There are member states in which uh, the highest uh, levels of government will participate in this exercise. We have a member state where the prime minister announced that he wants to participate, to see how he would react. And they're very simple things, and I will finish with that. A few days ago, Anissa, uh, produced its yearly threat landscape report. It is a very interesting document because you see, yes, that threats are moving, uh, a threat that uh, malware continues to be number one and web-based attacks number two. But between the other top 15 threats, things are moving and you also see new types of threats. So you see there information leaks, data breaches. These are not traditional cyber attacks but now they're incorporated in the threat landscape because they come from the digital society and they become in importance much, much higher than other traditional web-based attacks that can be managed through technological tools. So I see that phishing continues to be uh, number four in terms of threats in Europe. Phishing is a threat. If you look at the En Marche campaign of President Macron in 2017, they suffered a severe blow from a simple phishing attack. But then you also have the information leaks and the data breaches that are also very important challenges when it comes to the elections. Thank you. So I, we've gotten a fairly optimistic picture here um, from both Google and the European Commission. I want to pick at that a little bit. But Ulrich, let me start with you. Uh, you. You painted a very good picture of the landscape. Is this 
a passing problem? You know, we have to deal with this for a few years and things will get better, or is this the new normal? I mean, is this going to be an inevitable part of the function of both the public sector and private companies that are providing important parts of in internet infrastructure for the next 20, 30 years for our democracies? Well, I think, first of all, uh, you know, putting on my security hat for a second here. What we're doing right now is to create defensive deterrence. We want to make sure that our resilience is so high that whoever wants to do something and interfere in our elections will not do it because the cost will be too high compared to what you will gain from it. And that's not because we're necessarily punishing, because that's a next step. That's the offensive deterrence, but because the resilience is so high that uh, they will not gain enough from it uh, compared to the value of monetary resources or whatever they put into it. That's what we're doing right now. That means, yes, it will, be a th it will continue to be a threat, but hopefully, and I think also uh, actually already right now, the, the return on investment is now decreasing. At the same time, we know that there are new things on the horizon. So I'm not going to you know, dive into deep fakes and all, but we do know that it's very easy today to create an audio file, which is completely fake, from about, I think, four hours of audio content from one person. So I've heard you know, fake audio files of Donald Trump, of uh, several other leaders. I've seen fake videos of uh, several leaders where they actually speak and where they interact in, in an environment that, we, we didn't, uh, that, that was maybe not even filmed before. And that's gonna, the potential for doing that is gonna skyrocket with not only AI, because you can create many different uh, situations, but also super, uh, quantum computing, of course. And then if you think about micro-targeting and you put that into the cocktail, you know, how many micro-targeted ads can I then do? Is, is 100,000 enough a day? 200,000 a day? 1 million a day? If I have unlimited computing power, uh, you know, can I then start basically just politically manipulating people into, uh, by giving them one exact piece of information that I know they like and not giving them everything else? So, you know, that's... That's not just a security problem, that's also a political problem of our model of democracy. Uh, so in that sense, I think we're gonna see it you know, for quite some time, we're gonna stick with this problem, but I think what we're seeing now in terms of bots and fake accounts and so, it will continue to be there, but the return on investment will be limited. So you mentioned offensive, and without getting into the whole hackback question, um, on the non-kind of cyber offensive side, we now have in Europe a political concept that we can use sanctions if we're attacked. Do you foresee sanctions against a foreign power that would attack European elections in this year? Could you, could you see that happening? I mean, I'm not to prophetize about anything. That's not my position now. If I was in the EPSC, uh, still, I would. <laughs> but... Um, but if I were to put on my EPSC hat for a little bit, uh, I would say uh, we are seeing more and more sanctioning of, uh, of countries who try to interfere in different ways uh, into EU member states. And EU member states have shown a willingness to do that. Um, have we seen the cyber diplomacy toolbox being actively deployed yet? Maybe not so much, but still more and more is coming into the toolbox. Uh, and it's all, it's mostly about the willingness. So, can you imagine member states moving into this territory? Personally, I, I could, but the EU Commission is not gonna put this on the table because this is, this is a decision which is up to the member states in the end. So, Milan, I have, there are many, many ways in which we could pick on Google and the role of private sector companies. I'm not gonna do that now because I have faith the panel will. I do wanna ask you one question that, is a frustration if you're Google, and I imagine Microsoft has this too because they have a program on, on providing infrastructure for elections and, and, and doing things more securely, which is you actually need to get people to use these tools. I mean, you've been offering two-factor authentication for, what, more than a decade? Maybe that's not... For a long time. And most people still don't turn it on. Uh, and, of course, you know, it's one thing for governments and the elections and the voting infrastructure, but... Uh, 
political parties are not controlled by governments. Um, and oftentimes it's, you know, the, it's the hacks of private emails, phishing of that type that are the biggest issue. What works to actually get the kind of power users around democracy? So journalists, political parties to actually up their cybersecurity game as opposed to just agree that they should? Thank you, because it's a very good question. Um, I think in, uh, in general, we are always getting back to, to uh, sort of media literacy issue. And uh, yet it might sound like a cliche, it's really the basic and really working with all the generations and really working with all different parts of the society and, and improving media literacy, improving, but also also sort of tech literacy and, uh, and the sort of tech hygiene is, is really uh, the, the ongoing, ongoing work. And since the, the threats are evolving and developing, also, also the, the, the means how to protect the, from themselves is, uh, is changing. I think what works the best is usually just examples from, uh, from past. And as I have mentioned, we have unfortunately seen very efficient uh, attacks on the, on the really high level, high level people. And uh, I think that that was a moment when all the other campaigners started really worrying about, about that. But you know, like even, even worrying about this in general doesn't really always boil down to, to people actually taking all the steps necessary and doing the two-step verification or even using the advanced protection program, which, which we also offer to the, to the really highly potentially targeted groups. So, so um, it's really about, about uh, talking to the people, talking um, in in-person trainings, uh, sharing the, the experience from, from the others and uh, working across the society. What about shaming people who don't use them, you know? Getting, getting journalists to ask politicians, do you have two-factor authentication enabled or are you actually securing your data or is that a little too aggressive? It's, uh, well, I wouldn't even call it shaming. I think, I think there, are, there are areas in between that we are even doing. There are uh, privacy checkups, there are, there are uh, notification, push-up notifications that uh, our users are getting from time to time. It's going to be the, user, the safer internet day is just, above the, uh, just behind the corner. So that's one of the moments when we are trying to remind all the people that they need to protect themselves. Uh, and with the, with the really vulnerable groups, we just need to go even, even beyond. The advantage is that since the groups are rather small, we can, we can really work with them. What we are trying to do right now is to work with all the, all the political groups here in Brussels, but also so sort of do, do the sort of top-down approach, but also from the bottom up, talk to, uh, talk to all, all our local colleagues so they can reach out to their counterparts in member states and in capitals. So, Despina, you've talked, very, you've talked about what the commission's doing with governments in different parts of member states, but a lot of the action uh, in individual countries around election security is come from elsewhere, from civil society. So you have the Chaos Computing Club in Germany, which basically went and discovered some vulnerabilities. Uh, in Estonia, a country I know well, it's the uh, sort of semi-civil uh, society cyber defense league that's done a lot of the awareness raising and even the technical work around securing elections. You have anti-fake news initiatives set up by civil society groups all across Europe. As a commission, and I, and I mean both very concretely in this room, because you have a lot of people here who are going to go home and think about what's going on and have megaphones, but also more generally, what would your message be to those who are not governments about what they can do in the next four months, either themselves or through democratic pressure on their governments to get ready for May? Well, as was already mentioned, everybody has uh, their responsibility. So everybody has to make sure they shield themselves. So I think cybersecurity is not just for others to provide, we have to provide it to ourselves. Especially these organizations that you mentioned have to protect themselves first. Then we have to create this relation of trust that when we become aware of something, we now actually have a system by which you can report it. Interestingly, when, uh, we, uh, when we adopted the NIS directive, you know that the agreement was that only operators of essential services and digital service providers have to report uh, incidents, uh, cybersecurity incidents, uh, to the authorities. However, we saw that um, there is a lot more that can be done by other organizations who wish to become also responsible and report. This is also very important. And then, indeed, we need to use our communities 
uh, to test the system. Uh, we need to he help them have means to access us in case they identify themselves vulnerabilities. In the commission we recently launched, uh, just uh, two weeks ago, a uh, system of bounties by rewarding people who come forward and identify vulnerabilities in, the, in, in, in our uh, systems. And I think governments must do the same. So use the, the society to help you, to shield you. But again, and coming back then to you spoke of two-way authentication, journalists, etc. When we made the recommendations on this information, we also included an element that was about the identification of those who provide the news. You know that in Europe we now have a European regulation about electronic identity, it's known as the ADAS regulation. And we try to promote it uh, and promote the member states to use it because we see it as a tool for security and privacy. And I do not understand why if you read a, a traditional newspaper, you can always find a trace to the person who wrote an article, even if it is anonymous, but on the internet you cannot do that. So I think that, again, uh, journalists, people in the media have a lot to offer, uh, not only through actions like taking down content that is false, but also in making sure that what goes up uh, is properly authenticated and its sources, even if presented as anonymous, are reliable. So everybody has a role to play for sure. All right, I'm hoping for some really critical questions and some ideas also. Um, we'll take a couple at a time. I think there are two microphones here. So you're right by the mic, so go for it. But, but please do stand up and use a microphone right there. Thank you. Very shortly, I, I come from a country which is experiencing uh, issues of uh, polarization, increased uh, racism, and so on and so forth. And a lot of studies demonstrate that uh, this is linked to micro-targeting, micro which is an issue we have on commercial advertisement as well. So the fact that, for example, Google, Facebook are able to offer the creation of very specific audiences, target audiences, and so my question is, uh, um, first of all, if there is a definition clearly uh, used in practice to differentiate between the commercial and the political advertisement, and what actions have been taken in order to limit uh, these uh, targeting uh, possibilities? Very good. Anyone else? Please. Yeah, Lawrence, if you can, there's one right there. If you've got a question, I think you need to come to the microphones here. I'll ask the most anticipated question in the history of uh, CPDP. Uh, Despina Ulrich, do you use two-factor authentication and or password managers? And uh, maybe to make it a little bit more interesting, can you sort of tell us a little bit about how the Commission deals with uh, security and confidentiality of everything it holds in its inboxes and, and on its servers, especially uh, in light of the, of the uh, data uh, glitch, breach, however you may want to call it, uh, that happened in Cyprus? Uh, just before Christmas, if I remember, remember correctly, which kind of shows that there are vulnerabilities uh, within the EU's own uh, information systems. So uh, what, what are the solutions there? What are you doing? How are you responding to this? And uh, do you have any plans on this in the coming weeks, months? Thank you. So I've got one more question over there, but we'll do another round. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your very positive intake. Um, my question will concern the storage of the data, because when we're talking about elections, it's pretty much the first thing that comes to mind. Where do we store the data? Given that the most of institutions that depend on the systems, on the companies that are not necessarily located in the European Union. And of course, we're having brilliant legal uh, controls, such as the NISD directive, uh, as, uh, as a legal practitioner and cybersecurity practitioner, I would say this is a great, um, great uh, tool. However, um, it's not applicable. If it's, it's not applicable to the organisations which are not necessarily located in the European Union. So I would like to know what is the opinion of the European Commission to this regard. Thank you. Good. So we've got one question clearly for Google. Um, we've got two for the Commission, and I may jump in and say something on data storage myself too. Please. Right. Uh, I will reply to the to the gentleman's very important, very good question on political advertisement. It's a it's definitely very challenging area and very important one to get right. And we've seen before that the political advertisement has been misused, 
and uh, and I think we all who are somehow operate uh, in in the area of, of of advertisement business understand that this needs to be this needs to be tackled properly. Um, we after uh, or even before the the U.S. midterm elections, we have introduced uh, very uh, specific and very narrow ways how to verify uh, who is uh, is. Uh, uh, Paying for the uh, for the advertisement, uh, so the verification goes really very very down to uh, just checking the IDs of people of individuals who are ordering the ads, to uh, verifying uh, whether the organization is really a political organization. We are making sure that they are not from uh, in the U.S. In terms, it was that uh, nobody from outside the U.S. could uh, could put up such an ad. The, uh, the political advertisement was always very clearly labeled as a political ad, and uh, there was always link to the ad transparency that, that I've mentioned, to the repository of these sort of creatives, be it videos, visuals, for all types of our advertisement platforms. So everyone could have seen who has been ordering which kinds of ads, can go through the whole creative sort of library, could have seen how much has been paid, and also based on what principles the individual has been targeted. And uh, for the political advertisement, the targeting is much narrower than for traditional commercial use. There are only three basic areas where we allow targeting for political ads. Uh, and this goes, by the way, really beyond the, the most of the most of the legislation in, in the in the states. It can be targeted only on location, on gender, and on age. And age, we go through like a couple of couple of age uh, age uh, areas. So these are the main these, these are the only only principles we have applied this to the to the U.S. midterms elections, and uh, we haven't really seen many many areas many attempts to tackle the system. Just, but a, the other question was, how do you distinguish? As in, you know, because I w I could put up a what I claim to you as a commercial ad. You know, it's for the, you know, for hats that say Hillary Clinton should go to jail, right? Is that a political ad or is that a commercial advertisement to sell apparel? Like how, do you, how, do you, how do you actually choose and enforce which ads you apply those principles to? I think was part of the question. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a really important one. Uh, we are tackling the area of the issue ads. And, uh, and at this point, we are uh, really targeting the, the political ads being those that are being ordered by political organizations and that are related to specific elections. So, I mean, if I'm, you know, the Macedonian group doing whatever, I could probably try, I could try and game the system, right? And then there's a cat and mouse game. Mm. Yes, but there are, there, are, there are other principles, there are other policies that we put in place, uh, policies on uh, misrepresentation, uh, policies on, uh, on uh, misleading content, and, and here these policies also apply. Despina? No, I, I, I would add that in this context, privacy rules, of course, become even more pertinent. Because to be able to target someone, they have to have given their consent for the data you will take from them. So I hope to also hear that you do it in accordance with all the relevant rules. And if I worked for Google, it would be the first thing I would say, to be credible. Because people, when they hear that this is how they are approached on the basis of their personal data, uh, they have an issue. They need to know, okay, so did I say this was okay? And we have a culture that is being created in Europe. That's why you cannot extrapolate the example of the US with Europe, because in Europe we now even issued, together with the package of last September, specific guidance on parties and how they have to respect uh, GDPR rules uh, in the electoral process. So this is very important. And, and then on the questions... And data localization. Well, um, I was asked... Commission. Yes, I was asked about uh, yes the systems of the Commission. I will not answer a personal question on whether they're used to weigh authentication, so you know, so, um, it's not the point. I can tell you privately, Lawrence. So, and I think you presume if I'm responsible for the ADAS regulation that requires to weigh authentication, you can presume my answer. I think what matters is uh, that the Commission preaches uh, something and that it does the same. 
So as an administration, we try to make sure our systems are protected, but we can become a victim as much as anyone. The example you referred to was not a commission example. It had to do with the council. I'm referring to what has been public information. And it was linked to what was possibly a mistake of respecting security rules uh, somewhere in the system of accessing restricted documents with council positions. Which shows you again the importance of training people, because I'm sure that the person who made this mistake was probably unaware that they were making uh, that mistake. What was very interesting there is the culture of identifying a vulnerability by a private actor who had the responsibility to report it, but who reported it to a newspaper, not to the authorities. This culture, I'm fine with the press playing its role, absolutely, but we have to go also to the culture, it goes to the question that Lucas asked me earlier, the responsibility of everyone. I'm a private actor, I discover vulnerability of a public sector, well, it would be good to tell them, if you want to go in parallel to the press, that's absolutely fine, uh, the public needs to know, it's also important because others will shield themselves. But this was the problem I had with that story, if you like. But again, the problem was a mistake there, it was not necessarily a vulnerability. And it shows you that we all have to protect ourselves. In the Commission, we have a whole department that deals with our IT systems and that uh, applies security requirements. We have systems of encryption for confidential information that we exchange even between us uh, that require uh, two-way authentication. So we try really to practice uh, very safe and secure practices. Anyone want to say anything about where the data is held? Well, I'll try to answer at least the things I can answer, uh, because we can't be experts in everything at, uh, uh, at the same time in the Commission. Um, on the two-factor verification, yeah, I, I don't think, you know, you can you cannot sit on the stage and say that you're not using it, so uh, what's the answer going to be? Uh, then you would invite everyone to, uh, to find out. Um, but I can definitely say that that I do use it personally uh, in many many uh, in many many regards. And in the commission, I mean, we cannot speak about how the security is in the commission, but generally it is quite high, and there are many steps of verification um, that we can say. I think. Um, and then I would say on the on the political ads and the issue based ads and the, the for instance the MAGA hat, Make America Great Again hat. Um, well, we have now actually established a system where, together with platforms, where we will see that political ads will go into a transparency basket. And now, uh, we also see, I think it was Facebook and uh, probably also Google, who acknowledge that some issue-based ads are also worthy of going into that basket. It's just a little more... You need a little more detail to know whether they should do so. And now we at least have the basket where we, with a public conversation and with more transparency, especially for civil society and uh, for researchers, we can have that discussion about what we should put into that transparency basket. So basically, the more we can clean sort of the public conversation uh, through this method, the better. Um, and then for micro-targeting, Again, uh, I'm, I'm not the, the, uh, the expert here, so, but I definitely uh, know that the GDPR does uh, attend to these problems. And then again, the GDPR is a rather new tool, so we are still in the process of finding out where it applies, where it does not apply, because we also don't want to hamper the digital society and economy that's growing underneath us right now. Um, and finally, on the data storage question, uh, again, I would say this is a very important question. Um, but I think here, again, the GDPR applies. As we've seen, for instance, with the strategic partnership agreement with Japan, um, data flows uh, between countries, uh, again, uh, this, this ties to the GDPR. But it also ties to something which is rather new, and which is digital resilience. And the digital resilience of all our systems in Europe Huawei, 5G, etc. is one part of that, but there's a broader discussion underneath that that we need to have. And that doesn't point to anyone. It basically just points to the fact that we need to be more secure about what we do with our data, uh, what we do with all our government secrets, all our business secrets, uh, all our private data. So just 
there's a concrete question I think you had that I don't think we got an answer to now, which is also around legally, how do the exceptions for public safety um, and so on in the GDPR and, free, and the free flow of data regulation apply? Maybe that's something we could talk about offline. Um, I'd love to chat, chat about it afterwards. Um, I already have at least three hands, the lady with the red sweater, the gentleman with the white and the red checkers, the gentleman in the black sweater in the back, and then also the gentleman here with the red and blue checkers. And I think that will take us to the end. So please, four questions, and then we'll have a final lightning concluding round. Or, okay, please. Okay. Hi, you, you mentioned sanctions, but before sanctions, there's a question of attribution when it's possible. And we've seen recently that member states have very different policies. Uh, Netherlands recently attributed hacks and uh, France ne is never doing so. So do you think uh, acts, uh, attacks should be attributed? The gentleman in the red and the white checkers? It's very special for me to be called a gentleman, thank you. Um, there's something that this panel incredibly didn't tackle. It's the billion bid requests every day elephant in the room, and I'm talking about ad auctions. Uh, my name is Johnny Ryan, I come from a company called Brave. Here's why I'm surprised it didn't come up today. The whole idea of compromising the electoral system relies on understanding what people are interested in and building profiles of them. And almost every single time we visit a website, a bid request goes out that broadcasts, among other things, a unique pseudonymous idea about us, often our latitude and longitude, what we're reading, and as you, if you saw the evidence we released on Monday, whether we're reading about left politics, hate speech, incest, the list goes on. And it's an industry list uh, defined by the IAB and Google, two separate lists. So we have a situation where ad auctions are leaking every single person's interests like a sieve day, like a sieve. And you're not talking about it. Now, I know why Google isn't talking about it. Why is the commission not talking about it? OK, good. <laughs> OK, and I hope I can call you a gentleman, the gentleman in black. My name is Mick Cusello. I was had a uh, chance to uh, represent civil society in a high-level group on online disinformation that was gathered by the, by the commission, and we tried to raise also these critical things. Yesterday, there was a, a stakeholder even where we took stock where we are with the online disinformation. And I was actually quite surprised that these privacy issues really seriously came only in the last panel with the researchers. So I'm basically thanking commission to kind of uh, trying to raise awareness and the European level as, as a whole but uh, please and also kind of encourage inside your services to kind of get this extremely important uh, dimension to come come into into force and uh, I think we will see all kinds of things for the elections already but now I would ask you ask that what are you already doing to kind of uh, evaluate and prepare for the next steps because uh, this is going to be one big exercise as such. Thank you mean the next steps after the elections or in the next few months? Basically just preparing, observing what is coming and what for the next ones. There is a new commission coming and, and what kind of organizational things are going. It's a huge coordination effort as we all know, but, um, but encouraging to prepare for that. Thank so, you. So we have 12 minutes, which gives everyone three and a half to four minutes to say some final remarks. I already have one conclusion I draw from some of the questions, which is that, uh, Despino, you should also invite the EDPB to your stakeholder meetings because there's clearly a lot of positive overlap with data protection and a lot, to, a lot of question into the mix, which is I think we've heard a lot in the, you know, when we were, just, when we were negotiating the GDPR and preparing for May 25th about the implications on cybersecurity cooperation and information sharing from the GDPR. Uh, and I'm curious if that's something that has come up, either people saying the GDPR is an obstacle, perhaps private companies who don't get the public safety exception, um, or people talking about sort of how to positively weaponize the GDPR in some of the ways that have been proposed, for instance, around the ad auctions question. Um, and I see, Despina, you're, you're jumping to go first, so we'll go from right to left, please. No, no, that's, uh, I don't need to go, I don't need to go first, because I 
has the urge. Well, first of all, thank you very much that um, you, you're bringing back privacy. And, and I disagree with, with the gentleman, I'm sorry I forgot your name, because I, I did mention earlier, and I even challenged a little bit Milan, that when you're dealing with this kind of targeted advertising, it always has to be uh, with the respect of privacy rules. Um, security and privacy go together. And uh, the increased number of data breaches that we see happening in the world demonstrates that we need to tackle them together. So I would, uh, somebody called me on Twitter just now, a privacy advocate. Uh, thank you for the honor. I'm not a privacy advocate, but I happen to, to serve the European Commission in that field, in the field of digital privacy. And I am delighted that it is together in the same team with security, because we need both. The way to secure privacy is by using security technology. And it is by no coincidence that it was the researchers uh, that the gentleman mentioned who mentioned privacy, because we try now to find how technology will serve, and I see some actually people uh, making exhibitions here in this respect, but in other places as well, how technology can serve the GDPR, how technology can serve privacy. And we need to create systems that are automated in this respect. We need to use technology to help people uh, apply the principles of the GDPR, to obtain consent in a meaningful and fast manner. So without hampering, hampering the access to digital uh, for people, but again, also giving them the opportunity to take ownership of the data. Uh, we are creating now uh, something in, in Europe that will serve the exchange of your electronic health record across Europe. We will announce this in uh, a few days' time, uh, this initiative. It's a European recommendation. And our idea is to use the European budget to build infrastructure that respects security and privacy by design at the same time. So this is the way the policy is going. We mentioned technology also for disinformation, for identifying we now sponsor through our research budget and in, in innovation, the technologies that will help you identify fake news. And I know that the industry is already buying such technology, but more people should be able to use that. Political parties should be able to use it. The media should be able to use it. So it, we are trying to play a role again to, to put everything together and to take a holistic approach. On cookies, I am grateful that you mentioned cookies because it is through cookies that your information spreads and you don't even know where it goes, the, the profiling. We have rules in Europe. We have re re rules and with the GDPR, you are supposed to give your consent in the same way as for any other data protection field, also for the cookies because the consent rule of the GDPR applies also to the privacy directive which is about the cookies. It is unfortunate, and Lucas definitely expects me to say that, that we have a proposal for a modern privacy regulation in Europe that we've been discussing for two years and that we have not managed to conclude. We are still trying, and we will continue to try, because we want to match the modernization of the GDPR also with modern privacy rules. But these will also help with security. A lot of what we have discussed in that regulation with the member states and the stakeholders is how do you still maintain access for security purposes so that you protect people. So you have to find always the right balance between security and privacy. It is a very thin line before one cross over to the others. But this is the philosophy behind our policies. Milan? Thank you. A uh, couple of concluding uh, remarks. First of all, I think, I think this panel and the questions show how important uh, transparency is, how important it is to explaining as a, as a private company to explaining everyone how our products work, how we operate, how we are targeted our users, uh, what are the tools out there and what we are what we are doing. And I think that in general tech sector and, and Google itself, we haven't been always uh, very successful in that and we are trying to improve this. And we are really trying to make sure that people understand how these things, uh, these things work. This, uh, this also applies to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the privacy to the privacy question. Uh, Despina, I think, rightly pointed out uh, to the fact that I haven't used this as a, as a first uh, thing. The thing is that, uh, that I, I take it uh, almost as granted and as automatic that we follow the, follow the legislation and the rules wherever we are operating. And that, uh, that uh, when I was talking about, the, for instance, the, the political advertisement, that uh, in the EU we are going above what is required by the law. 
but it's also about cooperation of, of uh, and, and responsibility of, of other actors. It's about the responsibility of uh, political political organizations. They need to follow transparency rules that are set by the by the local legislations. It's about the regulatory bodies that need to that need to step in and control these. And it's also about the watchdogs and the, and the civic society. That's why, and we've already seen this before, the, the transparency register is being used by watchdogs and by by uh, civil society to really go back and and see who, what was the targeting, and based on that they can read uh, much more. And uh, and the last uh, the last remark is. Is what is what is extremely important is that the work that we've been talking about here doesn't really end in the end of May 2019 when the European elections are applied, but this is a continuous effort, and uh, and we don't really we cannot afford to to stop there, and uh, and make sure that all these principles continue uh, are being in place, and really we can learn from the from the very vast experience of the May 2019 elections. Anything on ad auctions? On ad auctions, I can, I can only, only repeat that, uh, that uh, the political advertisement has very strict targeting principles and we cannot, we cannot and we do not allow go above these. Okay, Ulrich, I think attribution was left for you. Yeah, attribution and maybe a little bit about, you know, next steps, if you allow. Um, Attribution, you're completely right. And the moment I had said that, I thought, oh, damn, I missed the, the attribution part. But I would say, um, making it quick, I think we see already today that some member states are ready to attribute, even if it's only based on a likelihood scale. And some member states will continue to, to be uh, ready to do that. Maybe others will jump on board. I would then throw it back to the industry and say, if you can provide us more, more secure attribution technology, then you will certainly see uh, the sanctions rate go up. Uh, that's, a, that's a prophecy for myself. But again, it's about technology right now, as I, as I understand it, and maybe an organization of how you know, uh, information is shared within the systems. Second, and then thank you, Miko. Uh, where are you? There. For, 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 for taking this question, I think... The elections are a milestone. It's an important milestone. That's why we care so much about it. And that's why we're going to do these monthly reports now with the Code of Practice signatories. Um, and I think what we need to see, um, not only up until the elections, but also afterwards, is basically that across all EU member states, that signatories and especially platforms have cooperation with researchers and fact checkers and civil society that they have their tools which are already developed spread to all of these i mean we can't just have a political ads database in one country that's not going to work uh let's get it out there soon and rather uh, sooner than later because uh if you have it for one country put it out there don't wait until you have all of them ready third we need to see investments we need to see how much people are actually investing especially the code of practice signatures because they signed to this in each of those member states. Because if we don't know where we're weak, we cannot become stronger together. And then we need the platforms to actually live up to those KPIs. We need to see, you know, what is the uptake of these new tools and what is the impact uh, that those fake accounts have actually had on their platforms. You know, how many people saw it? Uh, how, did it uh, how did it spread? You know, did it make them do something different? Um, we need to see that. And finally, for member states, because this is not an only an exercise for platforms, uh, and as I said before, it's also a, a, an exercise for, for the advertising industry in general. I mean, we need to see more from them too. It can't just be uh, associations saying that members will have to do something. They need to show it too. But for member states, I think it's already quite clear they're organizing themselves in this rapid alert system. We need many more member states to sign up as quickly as possible because uh, if not, then we will not have it ready and we need it ready by March. That's what we promised. Second, it would be good with, if member states could actually step in and start funding more fact checkers through arm's length principles. That would, I mean, we've already called upon this many times. Third, offline needs to apply to online as well. We've said this many times uh, and basically, if we don't know that political parties in all of Europe are registering to show what they are spending online, uh, then you know the offline uh, elements of elections will be at disadvantage. 
Finally, there's been already said it, exercises, 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 and maybe even trip wires and discussions about when do we start saying something to the public, who does it, how do we avoid more polarization that we already have. Thank you for those concrete points. My only closing thought is this. I think it's important to remember how we got to this conversation. It was investigative journalists, in particular after the 2016 elections in the US and in Brexit, as well as activists who drew attention to this. Before then, it has been activists and academics for more than a decade who have investigated the cybersecurity of online elections and of elections in general. Um, I've in a previous life working for a national government, been on the receiving end of some of those critiques. Um, this discussion has happened because we've had a broader set of people involved. Um, governments and companies act when they're pressured to. Hopefully it's positive pressure, which is just to say, there's now an infrastructure for the cooperation. It's not going to work unless we all stay involved. So I want to thank you for your questions. I want to thank our panel, both for what they said today and for the work they're doing. And uh, let's hope that we have a positive post-mortem, or I should say after action discussion four and a half months from now and that it's not in fact a post-mortem. And please give everyone a hand. <laughs>